So first of all, thank you very much for coming. I've not been to one of these events before. Uh, so thanks for the invite to the organisers. And again, yeah, thanks to you all for popping along. If you thought Dave's talk was um, philosophical, interesting about um, science, engineering, uh, and about the durable nature of the things that we do. And I've been very lucky, actually. Dave interviewed me at, at ThoughtWorks when I started. Um, so things like the test room development question for me was go and work at ThoughtWorks because that's where you learn how to do TDD properly, right? The London School of Test Room Development started in ThoughtWorks. Um, but the talk I'm, I'm going to do is almost, it's an extension, if you like, of Dave's talk in some ways because it's about how I see the, under, like the foundational principles um, of not just software development, but actually the whole world, in fact. Biology, um, life, organizations, cities, and software and software engineering. Um, and this is something I've been interested in for a little while. Uh, it's some, it's about, it's the, t the topic really is about something called complex adaptive systems. And I'll come on to talking and defining what they are in a bit. But my talk is not called SCAR, DevOps, and Flow. In fact, it's Flow, DevOps, and Scale. I obviously mis, uh, mispasted that somehow. Um, but it's not the sort of flow that we're used to thinking about when we're talking about continuous delivery, lean, agile. I'm actually going to be talking about things like blood flow and traffic flow through physical infrastructure and through our bodies. Um, similarly, the scale I'm talking about, I'll be talking about, is not the sort of scale that, you know, ten, managing 10,000 servers or how you scale to Google scale. Um, it's going to be about how things grow and the similarities in how lots of different things grow. And I'll be hopefully tying some of that together to some stuff around software because we're not biologists or city planners, we're actually technologists in the room, right? So that might be useful. So I'll just summarize the things I'll be talking about here once I've turned this on. So the first thing I'll be talking about is this idea of corporate metabolism. So I'll ask you, a question, ask you a question to the room. Hands up who works for a company that has got faster as it's gotten bigger. So as you've added more people to your organization, everything has got faster. Anyone? One person. Do you work for Amazon? <laughs> Sorry? Right, so you're still tiny. OK, fair enough. For those of you in the front, no one put their hands up, by the way, at the back. Um, and that's, that's, that's interesting, right? Why is it that as we scale, as, as the organizations we work for scale, as the systems we work in scale, the teams we work in, why do things slow down? Why does it feel like the corporate metabolism slows down as companies get bigger? The next thing I'll be talking about is, if that's the case, how do you identify those signs of aging? How do you work out whether you are getting slow? Um, and I think this is of interest if you're a very big company, because you can take a sort of baseline and say, actually, we're very big, we're very slow. Uh, so this is a route, or a, a way of getting better and identifying that. But also if you're a startup or a scale-up, actually I think this is kind of interesting because how do you work out the point at which, as a startup or scale-up, you're about to become one of these behemoths that just slows down and everything becomes like treacle. That's the, the second thing. The third thing, it's tricky, but companies die. I mean, we're in Pivotal's offices, right? Companies die, not that I'm saying Pivotal's <laughs> going to die, but... <laughs> But, what I'm, but it is true that Pivotal has been the cause of other companies' deaths, if you like. Right? They've taken over other companies, they've acquired other, other companies, and other companies have acquired Pivotal. The half-life of uh, an organization, a company, a listed company on the big exchanges is 10 and a half years. 50% churn on the exchanges in 10 and a half years. So companies die all the time for various reasons. So why is that? What are the reasons? Sorry? I missed that. Money laundering, that's absolutely one of them. GDPR, yes. Um, and then the final thing I'll, I'll, I'll talk about is this idea of the alchemist's stone. Is there a solution to the, the, the problems that I'm going to be describing around aging, slowing metabolism, death, both in companies, organisms, cities, and things? And the reason I'm interested in this is, like Dave, actually, my background originally was physics. I was a terrible physicist, awful. Um, I'm not smart enough or diligent enough uh, to be a th theoretical physicist, essentially. Um, and I certainly don't have the attention to detail 
to be an experimental physicist, but physicists are still sort of self-identifying as in some way, shape, or form. I have a professional qualification in it, so, you know, suck it up, <laughs> basically. Um, and as a physicist, I guess, I, I, I kind of search for underlying truths, if you like. That's kind of what a lot of physics is about, trying to, put, to identify patterns in the world and in the universe, and trying to understand what the simple laws are that can explain those patterns, can uh, explain nature as we observe it. Um, um, a few years ago, I was five years ago now actually, I was very lucky because I, I worked with Martin Fowler to define what microservices are or how we saw microservices. Um, we came up with these 10 characteristics. I won't go through all of them because that's, well each one of them is like a three hour talk in, in, in and of themselves. Um, but the interesting thing here with these common characteristics that we identified is a lot of them talk to decentralization. A lot of them talk to modularity, as Dave was talking about, to separation of concerns, to breaking big things up into smaller things, whether that's um, like big projects being broken up into small number, into numbers of products, or taking um, IT departments and creating business capabilities, to bre breaking big things up into smaller things. And the power you get um, by, by doing that and then plugging these things together in, in mysterious, wonderful ways. I was kind of thinking over the last five years, what, why is this working? Why do so many, and admittedly, not in all cases, microservices and that style of architecture doesn't work everywhere, um, but certainly for companies at massive scale, um, they've seen a lot of success with, with the microservice approach. So why is it that these things work? So I'm sure you're familiar with Conway's law. Uh, I have to mention Conway's law. It's like the, the law, <laughs> it's like Conway's meta law. The meta law of Conway is every single technology event you have to mention Conway's law. Um, but I like this sort of very brief summary of it. Organizations which design systems are constrained to produce designs which are copies of the communication structures of those systems back in 1968. Or as my colleague Evan Botcher uh, puts it, uh, if you design the organization you want, the architecture over time will follow potentially kicking and screaming eventually. And Conway's law is about essentially information flow in companies. It's about how teams are structured and the information flow between teams and between individuals on those teams and how that affects the design of software in those organizations. Now I was very lucky at the start of the year to be at an event. Um, I'll tell you a brief anecdote uh, about this event because ladies and gentlemen that is Mel Conway. Would you believe? I was at an event with Mel Conway. This is the, the bit that if you've ever done any logic uh, is known as the, the appeal to authority. <laughs> but that's Mel Conway. I was at an event with Mel. Uh, Dave should have been there. He missed his flight, which is a real shame. Um, this is Adrian Cockcroft in the middle, who's ex-VP uh, at Netflix, uh, cloud engineering, and he's now at, now at Amazon. Um, and Mel was there. We had an open space one afternoon. Um, where we were discussing the ways to w the things, the applications to which we put Conway's law as, as a group of about 20 or so. And of course Mel was there, he's in his sort of mid, mid 80s these days, you know, he's pretty much um, you know, not traveling so much anymore, not so involved. But you could see him sort of with his head in his hands, we, we were sort of talking, Adrian was talking about Netflix and how they organize, uh, they have the UI teams and then sitting next to them they have platform team as an API platform, then sitting next to them, they have microservices, and they organized the whole, or the whole building around Conway's Law, and Mel was there going, oh my god, this is, I wrote this 50 years ago, you know, um, this, is, this, is, this is scary. And one of the things um, that someone said at this event, unrelated to, to Mel, but Mel was there, was someone from Amazon, who I can't mention the name of because Chatham House, um, but they said, they made this really interesting observation, they said about Amazon, that the bigger we get, the easier it gets to get bigger. Let me go back to the question I asked at the start. How many people work for a company like that? They went on further and said, the more teams we add, the more products we build, the easier and faster it is for us to add new products, build new products, and release new software. I thought that was an astonishing observation. Absolutely astonishing. Because, I mean, the prevailing wisdom, of course, going back to Mythical Man Month again, is you know, this idea of adding manpower to a late software project will only make it later. Adding more people is, is not a silver bullet. So how is it that Amazon, AWS, 
and managing this, this kind of conjuring trick, if you like. And I've been doing a bit of reading around complex adaptive systems and things and scaling laws and power laws, which we'll come on to. Um, and so I went and did a bit, bit of research. Um, I produced this utterly insignificant from a uh, data point perspective graph. But nonetheless, based on real figures, this is AWS revenue plotted against AWS employee count. And the interesting thing about this graph, if you can see, is the exponent, which is 1.15. You can see over there, that exponent, 1.15. And what that tells us is as AWS in particular doubles the number of employees they have, they more than double the revenue that they bring in. So their revenue is increasing at 115% by employee count, which is pretty cool. You might think, well, you know, surely everyone does that, and that's, would be, that would be far from the truth. 85% is the general accepted figure for scaling at company size by revenue. Employees, employees. this is total employees. Real retail, uh... This is across all of Amazon, yeah, as I say. We can read something into this or not, but it backed up my original point, so hey, science. <laughs> and so the rest of this talk is about why. Why is it that allegedly Amazon are scaling in this way? They're able to more than double their revenue as they double their, their, the, the organization's size. And to do that, we're going to have to start with a brief and an almost certainly incomplete introduction to nonlinear dynamics and complex adaptive systems. So you've had your beers, right? <laughs> Awesome. Um, it's a bit late in the day for, for this, but we'll, we'll give it a go. Here's some questions. What do mice and elephants have in common? Yeah, hmm? They both have olfactory organs. Or oh, is that smell? I think that's smell, isn't it? They both have ears. Someone at the back. The number of heartbeats that they have in their lifespan. This is true actually, I don't know if anyone else in the room knew this. So all mammals have roughly the same number of heartbeats in their lives, about one and a half billion. It's true. What this graph is though, this is actually the graph of metabolic rate for mammals as they get bigger. And you might expect, right, so as an animal like doubles the size from a mouse to something twice as big as a mouse, that they would need twice as much energy. The basal metabolic rate would be twice as as much, right? Because there's twice as much stuff in the thing that's twice as big as a, a mouse. But that's actually not what happens at all. In fact, metabolic rates in animals scale at about 75%. As you double the size of an animal, it only needs about 75% of the calories uh, to survive, to, to, to live, to reproduce, them, etc. Which is kind of interesting. So as a mammal doubles in size, it only needs about 75% of the calories. And this is an example of this thing called a scaling rule. And the scaling rule of this is 3 over 4, so 75%. Next question. What, what do news agents, so that your mom and pop store, and Walmarts, Tesco, Sainsbury's, have in common? And I gave you a tip about this a minute ago. So that, interestingly, they're self-similar scaled versions of one another. So if you look at revenue, again, by employee count, and if you look at uh, for, for very large and very small organizations, you can see the scaling law with an exponent of about 85%. So as you double the size of a company, you get about 85% of the revenue coming out of it. And this is something that you know, our CFOs are pretty happy with, because our CIOs, you know, because they, they, they talk about economies of scale. And this is exactly what our finance folk refer to when they say economies of scale. As we get bigger, we'll only make 85%, but we'll also only have to spend 85% on infrastructure. It's an economy of scale. What about Hamburg and Leipzig? I did this talk in Germany, you can tell. Well, interestingly, with cities, they also exhibit the same scaling law, 85% for infrastructure. So as you double the size of a, of, of a conurbation, a town, you go from a town to a town twice its size, you only need to spend about 85% of the cash on roads, on water pipes, on electricity cables, sewage, 
all these different things. Infrastructure in cities scales with this same law, 85%. And that's true for things like petrol stations. You'd think you'd need twice the number of petrol stations, twice the number of people. It's not true. You need 85%. Or rather, not need. This is what's been observed by doing the research, looking at the data, and analysing how many petrol stations these different places have. It's kind of interesting. These are things are everywhere. And I like this, this line from Jeffrey West, who wrote the classic book, well, fantastic book, Scale, that came out of the Santa Fe Institute. And he says, quantities that do not change when other parameters of the system change, these things play a special role in science. They point the way to these underlying principles. Underlying principles. And these scaling rules, once you start looking for them, they appear everywhere, across all different types of thing, be it life, be it organizations and companies, be it cities, be it the software that we actually work on as well. So just to define my term again, um, linear scaling is when you double, this, double one quantity, you get double in the other quantity if you plot them like this. Normally plotted log logarithmically or semi-logarithmically. -log the economies of scale, sublinear scaling, is if when you have twice as much of one thing, you don't have to have or don't get twice as much of the other. So my interest in this goes back to reading this book some years ago called The Quark and the Jaguar. So this is by a guy called Murray Gell-Mann, uh, he came up with the term, he coined the, the term quark, actually. So he's a Nobel Prize winner. Um, he's at Los Alamos um, with Richard Feynman, long-term collaborator of his. Uh, and he wrote this book to describe his great passion, which was, why is it that we get such beautiful complexity in the world, like us, or jaguars, from these simplest of components, these quarks? So I started reading a bit more about this, and I found this place, as I say, the Santa Fe Institute, which is in uh, New Mexico. This was started in the sort of 80s, and it was a group of Los Alamos scientists, essentially, who got together from very different backgrounds, nonlinear dynamics, but biology, economics, in order to create a sort of cross-functional, if you like, think tank, or university, or institute, um, to study what they came to call complex adaptive systems. And they describe complex adaptive systems as having four distinct characteristics. So complex adaptive systems are, exhibit self-similarity. So the basic building blocks of a complex adaptive system are the same. They're self-similar. But also as they scale, they're self-similar in scale. As you, as you get as a, a bigger complex adaptive system, self-similar to a smaller one. They're fractal, if you like, in that way. They're also self-organized. So in the same way that our bodies, as we grow, the cells in our bodies self-organize into lungs and things, or if you like, people in organizations self-organize into uh, teams sometimes, <laughs> in the effective ones, or in cities, people self-organize into neighborhoods, and those, peop those people, or cells, are self-similar. They have self-organization. They also exhibit this idea of complexity. And when, it, when they talk about complexity, complexity, they have a very specific uh, definition. The com complexity they talk about is that, as you, uh, is that essentially the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. So as you add bunches of these self-similar, self-organized things together, they create uh, more complex and then more complex and then more complex structures. So we come from cells. And then emergence. So complex adaptive systems display emergent behavior. And the fun thing is, is that over the last sort of 15 years or so, the work that Jeffrey West and others have been doing have led to three principles that appear to explain all these different scaling laws that I mentioned at the start. So metabolic rate in, in mammals, uh, revenue growth in organizations, and infrastructure costs in cities. And those principles uh, actually are related, again, to some stuff that Dave was talking about. In fact, they sort of underlie a lot of it, I think. The first thing is this idea of uh, space-filling fractal networks. You get different types. This is a hierarchical network. Um, this idea of space-filling fractal networks, like our blood, our circulatory system, or like, if you like, the sewage uh, system in London, or the water distribution network. Hierarchical space-filling fractal networks. They also have, this is my favorite new term for uh, consultants, Invariance terminating units. This is what we should all start calling our colleagues. Hello, Mr. Mrs. Self uh, 
invariant, sorry, invariant terminating unit. Um, but you know, th this is another one of these, 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 these principles. So in, in our bodies, it's cells, and actually capillaries and things. But in organizations, it's people doing work. And in cities, it's things like houses and people living in houses. You have these two different things. And the third thing is optimization, going back again to feedback. And in these different types of, of network, or sorry, different types of complex adaptive system, of which we are one, just one example, it, optimization takes different forms. I think there was, there was a question about evolution or taking, um, taking uh, inspiration from nature in engineering. We talked about DNA a bit. I mean, actually, and I think Dave made the point that that's a very slow and messy process. I mean, but it's had hundreds of millions of years, or mi certainly millions and millions of years, to produce us. That's the feedback mechanism for life, is essentially evolutionary processes. But for companies and for cities, it's market forces. Economics is the optimization mechanism that's driving evolution of these, of these complex adaptive systems. So, they're everywhere, essentially, just to get over this first bit. Patterns in metabolic rate, revenue growth, all these different things, they can all be described, and by which I mean you can write an equation, which they have done, based on these principles, which will explain, or rather predict, those power laws, those scaling laws. And these properties scale generally as a power law for these things with an exponent less than one, so they display economies of scale. And essentially, a mom and pop store and Walmart or Tesco, they're the same thing. They're self-similarly scaled versions of, of each other, which sounds bizarre, in the same way that we are a self-similarly scaled mouse. We are the same as a mouse, as a mouse or an elephant. So, on to corporate metabolism. Why is it then that metabolic rates, as I said, slow as size increases? Well, we have this fixed number, essentially, one and a half billion heartbeats. And we've got this, this, this thing that, you know, metabolic rate, which is scaling at 0.75% as you, as you double the size. Essentially, what happens is, the heart rate in an elephant is much, much, much slower than the heart rate of a mouse. The Etruscan shrew's heart beats, I think it's about 20, no, it's like, I think it's something like a thousand times a second or something unbelievably fast. It's the smallest mammal you can get. And that's essentially what gives. And that's why elephants live longer than mice, because they literally live more slowly. Their cells age much, much more slowly than a mouse's cells age, or than our cells age. They don't get many cancers, elephants. Blue whales get even less. It's kind of a bizarre thing, isn't it? And why is that? What, what are the effects, these principles that are sort of driving this? Well, it, with mammals, it's essentially the circulatory systems that, we, that we've got, that we've, it, evolution has uh, created over time. We get a heart, we get a bunch of arteries, and a bunch of capillaries essentially. And then at the bottom, we've got a bunch of cells that those capillary, capillaries are delivering uh, essentially nutrients, energy to. Right. And this here's a fun thing about optimization, an example of optimization. When an artery splits into two arteries, the cross-sectional area of the original artery and the two others are, are identical. They, when you add them together, they become, they're, it's, they're the same. And that's because if they weren't, if they were different sizes, there'd be an impedance mismatch at the boundary, and essentially your heart would be beating against itself. So you'd get back pressure, essentially, literally like back pressure in the software systems we build or look after, right? You get back pressure at the point of an artery splitting, which would cause more strain in your heart. So over time, evolution has optimized that away. So now our arteries are exactly, they split into exactly two arteries with exactly the same size. This is why, of course, plaque is built up in arteries is bad, it's causing back pressure. This is going to lead to bad things happening, heart attacks and so on. And essentially, this, the metabolic rate is caused by this fractal effect of big things going into smaller and smaller and smaller things until eventually you get capillaries feeding blood, uh, sorry, feeding cells. And this idea of feedback between, uh, sorry, impedance matching between the different sizes of arteries. But the fun thing is, the difference, there's no difference really between the smallest mammal and the biggest mammal. The only difference is the depth of the hierarchy. Right? The depth of the hierarchy of arteries, before they become capillaries, is the thing that leads to the different metabolic rates. 
It's the network, the invariant terminating units, and evolution optimizing. Essentially, the cells are the same size. And this is why there's a lower limit on mammal size. Uh, actually, this is a fun fact. Your, um, your blood supply can be seen as basically AC and then DC. And the limiting, fact, the limiting size of a mammal is that you have to have at least some pulse rate. If you don't have a pulse, you can't have a mammal, essentially. So there has to be at least one, uh, one level in the hierarchy above your capillaries where you can get a pulse. Otherwise, you wouldn't get the economy of scale, and so nature has optimized that out. So we don't get any smaller than that. Pretty cool, huh? Anyway, Godzilla does, can't exist. If they did some work on this, its heart would have to be huge, and its legs would have to be like 60 meters across or something to support its body weight. So they also did some fun stuff with this, with this research. But essentially, this hierarchy is the thing that causes the economies of scale as metabolic rate scales with size. This impedance mis uh, sorry, matching in the circulatory system, uh, and these three, these, which is caused by these three principles acting. And the same thing happens in companies, actually. The same thing as companies grow, they get more efficient driven by market forces. Right? And they make more money as they get bigger. But the same hierarchies, the same self terminate, sorry, invariant terminating units and optimization um, leads to this slowdown in corporate metabolic rate. It's fundamental. It's literally built into the hierarchy. It is a, it's, it's a, an effect of how we structure companies, which is fun. And you can sort of see that, if you like. And if you look at things like flow of work in organizations, um, I've got a little value stream map up. Uh, I say a little one. This is quite a long one from a client I've anonymized. Um, and the little, I think if you can see, there's these little red things. These are cues in this value stream map. Obviously, this is the flow of work going from, you know, from concept into production. Um, and all these little cues in there, essentially they're acting as like deliberate blockages in the corporate arteries, if you like. As we add cues into our systems, as we add things like Jira tickets, lots of tickets, as we um, you know, have change request boards and all these sorts of things, we're actually deliberately blocking the corporate arteries. Um, not only is the hierarchy slowing us down, but we're deliberately giving ourselves heart attacks at the same time. So no wonder it's a bloody nightmare if you work in a big company, right? This is, this is shuddering from one kind of almost demise to another almost demise. You know, Don Reinitz in the great book Principles of Product Development Flow, he talks about the effects of cues, longer <laughs> cycle time, increased ri risk. Essentially what we're doing is we're introducing back pressure, we're introducing impedance mismatching when we put cues in in these big hierarchies. So for corporate metabolism, as companies scale, they add more and more and more layers of hierarchy, right? Often with scale-ups, you end up with this, this problem we see all the time, where you get this like bloated level of uh, middle management, and then they fill out the bottom bit. It bloats a bit more, and they fill out the bottom bit. Adding more hierarchy and slowing things down. And this, is, this is increase in size means that just literally the depth of the hierarchy leads to this, this slowdown, this, this slowdown in corporate metabolism. But we also deliberately block our arteries, which sucks. So how can we identify the signs of aging? Well, I did mention that there would be something about software in here, and there is. Uh, and this is, I think, if you know, Dave and Jez's uh, book was one of the most important books of the century, if you like, for what we do, and even before that, then I think Accelerate is, is one of the, the most important books that has come out since about what we do. So if you haven't come across Accelerate, this is based on the state of DevOps um, report, and it talks about the methodology they use in the state of DevOps report, um, and it talks about uh, the different characteristics that leads to different types of organizational performance. Here's a fun fact. If you haven't read this, change request boards are bad. These are correlated with low performance. Um, if you have a change request board, it's correlated with you being a low performance organization. And this is not in terms of IT performance, this is in terms of revenue or profitability, whatever, whatever internal goal you set yourself, right? change request boards will correlate with you being badly performing or in the low performing group. Another fun fact, outsourcing by job functions, so outsourcing all your testing, also correlates with low performance. Outsourcing all your development correlates with low performance. Uh, it's kind of fun. It's, it's also good because they found no correlation if you outsource like a product build. So if you were to come to Pivotal, say, or ThoughtWorks and say, hey, can you build this thing for us and then hand it back? 
there's no correlation with, with low performance, which is good, because otherwise I'd have to stand up here and say, don't hire me, and that would be bad, uh, you know, politically and uh, uh, from a revenue perspective for, for ThoughtWorks. But if you outsource testing, that's correlated with, with low performance. And you can kind of see why when you think about this information flow, what I was talking about, if you outsource an entire function, essentially you're adding in, again, layers and layers of hierarchy, layers of queues and tickets and change requests and all this stuff. Back pressure you're adding into this, the corporate circulatory system, if you like. And the other fun thing is, as I mentioned, you know, I mentioned the different uh, the, the, um, that biology and the biological systems and things. If you think about it, you know, what are the things that doctors look for? You know, if we go to the GP, what are the sorts of things that they, they, they look to us in, in terms of identifying whether we're okay or not? They think about you know, blood pressure, they take our blood pressure, probably heart rate, probably body temperature. Um, they look in your ear, I don't know why they do that. But various different things that, that correlates in their minds with different aspects of wellness, right? Very high blood pressure, bad, probably. Very, very fast heart rate, probably bad. And in the same way that a GP can do that, I think the metrics that came out of Accelerate can act as these, the same thing, leading indicators, if you like, that correlate with organizational health and metabolism. So mean time to recovery, cycle time, change failure rates, and number of deploys per unit time. These are literally the, the same as taking your blood pressure or checking your heart rate. It's not that they're going to. It's not that if these are really good, you're definitely going to be, um, you know, really you know, profitable or whatever. But if you've got, um, if if these are uh, optimized for, then it, it's correlated with you being in a better place as a company. So these are leading indicators of organisational health, which we can actually monitor as teams. Um, to work out whether we're slowing down or not. The bigger, slower organizations, they're going to have different properties of these, different, sorry, values of these than smaller, uh, more agile organizations. So these four key metrics, they're, they're, they're this indicator, I think. They're the equivalent of heart rate, blah, said this. Beer, need beer now. I don't know if beer correlates with better conference talks. We'll see at the end, I suppose, when you give me feedback. But it will be an end of one, because I've never done it before. So, and it, it, but the point of improving these things is that it's to the limit implied by the network in which you're in, the corporate hierarchy in which you're in. If you're in a hierarchical organization, you can only get as good as that 85% that I mentioned earlier, implied by the scaling law, because that's just inherent in the physical structure of the organization you're working in. Whew. That sucks, right? It's quite depressing if you're in a hierarchy. But it will still help because you'll get to the limit or to approach the limit. Now onto corporate mortality. I mentioned at the start, 10 and a half years is the half-life for organizations, listed, organiz listed companies. Why is that? Well, the research seems to point to the fact that, uh, to, to essentially where organizations, as they get bigger, start, start, start or actually stop spending their money. Essentially, larger organizations become much, much less, uh, they become much more risk averse in general, and they, s they spend a far, far, far smaller fraction of the money they have available on research and development, and much, much more on maintaining the status quo. Essentially, they spend a lot of money on making sure that, essentially, you, know, you don't keel over, it doesn't keel over, but they forget to spend on R&D, on R essentially. And this appears to be correlated with, uh, with corporate mortality. And, compounding the problem, as you add more layers of hierarchy, you tend to add more process, more constraints. You end up with these much, much deeper hierarchies, and you add more things like queues. And these hierarchies grow and grow and grow and grow and grow, and sometimes they keep growing and growing and growing and growing. So I'll conclude this by saying, when we organize ourselves into hierarchies, a, f a literal physical property of those hierarchies is this economies of scale. It's the idea of an economy of scale. It's a function of the hierarchy itself. So if you double in size, you, you're not going to get double the thing that you're expecting. You're going to get a fraction of that, something less than one. So you're going to get sublinear growth in revenue, but you're also going to get sublinear uh, growth in infrastructure spend. So this is why we like economies of scale, if you like. 
but you're also going to be decreasing the organization's metabolic rate. It's actually true in a bigger organization. The reason things feel so slow is because they are slower, <laughs> like actually. And then you know, they die, which is bad. But we have an answer to this. Of course we do. I'm going to teach you how to make more money than God. Uh, Croesus would be you know, jealous and all this kind of stuff. Also, we're going to destroy the planet if we do this. So, hmm. <laughs> talking about ethics earlier. Because <laughs> hmm. there's another idea, which is this concept of returns to scale. If you've got economies of scale, which is you know, sublinear growth, there's this other concept, returns to scale, superlinear growth. So not exponential growth, but super exponential growth. The more, when you double something, you get more than double back. And this is what I was saying about Amazon at the start. And the fun thing is, there is an example of things that do this, complex adaptive systems that exhibit returns to scale and economies of scale, and it's cities and towns. So cities, they exhibit economies of scale, as I mentioned, for the physical infrastructure, so things like petrol stations, water pipes, all this kind of stuff, but they exhibit economies of scale, sorry, returns to scale for all the socio-economic factors, things that you can measure. So as you double the size of a town to a small city, say, you, you actually double, more than double, the number of patents that might be applied for in that city. You get returns to scale on innovation. You get returns to scale on wage growth, actually. Um, you get returns to scale on the number of professionals that live in a city. So you'll get more than double the number of lawyers in a city double the size. <laughs> but also more than double the number of software engineers. But, and this is not for free, obviously, other socioeconomic factors also scale this way, so you get more than double the amount of crime, more than double the amount of pollution, more than double the amount of disease as you double the size of an organization. This is why cities are so successful, right? So you, as you double the size of something, it's cheaper to get bigger. So it's cheaper to add more infrastructure, so it's cheaper for cities to grow, and you get the double whammy of getting more good stuff out as well, and bad stuff. But this is why there's been this massive migration, of course, to, to cities over the last century or so. And I think if you look at China, I think they're looking to deliberately build another something like 100, 100, 1 million person plus cities in the next uh, decade or something. Oh, uh, fun fact. You know, you know, this whole thing about, you know, God, everyone walks so fast in London, you know. Um, yes, it's true. Uh, walking speed also exhibits return to scale. As you go from a village to a village twice as big, people walk 110% faster. It's, and they, they analyzed this on, by using mobile, anonymized mobile phone data that MIT had a big tranche of. So yes, people do walk faster in big, big towns. It's quite, it's, I love that, it's a great fact. So why is it then, what are the, if I say that hierarchies and things govern the economies of scale, scaling laws, what is it that governs the other one? Returns to scale. Well, it turns out there's another, there are other types of fractal space-filling network one of which is something called a small world fractal network. So social networks, oh, let me go back, sorry. So small world fractal networks, so you're familiar, I'm sure you're familiar with this, this is basically Facebook, Twitter, all these different things. If you're doing brokerless pub sub or gossip protocols, um, that's, that's basically what this is, small world fractal networks. And small world fractal networks combined with something else, which is basically human nature, and the size of our heads. But this is how many connections we can hold with other humans in our heads. So this diagram shows, on the one hand, the sort of idea of a small world fractal network, but also it shows Dunbar's numbers. Uh, if you've come across Dunbar's numbers. So Dunbar's number, so the famous one is 150. This is like the 150 sort of people you know in work that you would recognize and be able to say, hi, how was your weekend? How did the golf go? As opposed to just walking past and not really recognizing them. So that's the kind of general size of the number of connections we can hold of acquaintances in our head at one point. 500, there's, there's a slightly broader group. We might recognize their faces. Um, and then there are smaller groups down to five, which is your actual, like pretty much a nuclear family, which sucks for me because I've got four kids. So one of them I actually must love less, <laughs> right? Because there's, there's only five in that. Anyway, moving on, this is a kind of bad joke, but true. So what governs this idea, you know, Dunbar's number? This is literally our brain chemistry. Like we can't hold, and research has reproduced this over the years, we can't hold 
more than these number of connections to a certain depth of knowledge about an individual. But the fun thing is about cities is we get to choose who those 500 or 150 people are. So as you go from a village of 150 people, they're everyone you know. Your Dunbar's number is everyone in the village, right? Whether, whatever it is they do, which is great from a community perspective. But as you double the size, or as you move to a city like London, umpteen million people, we get to choose who those 150 people are. So we aggregate together amongst like-minded people, essentially. You know, this is why universities happen in cities. This is why these meetup groups happen here. Right? We, we're coming together to share our experiences with like-minded. We get to choose that. And that fact, the small world networking effect, and again, so, you know, invariant terminating units, which is us, that governs the socioeconomic 115% return to scale that we get. Well, that's kind of interesting, isn't it? I think it's interesting. So on the one hand, you get economies of scale governed by hierarchies, and then you get returns to scale governed by these sort of social networks or small world, uh, uh, small world networks. And you can kind of see why this is interesting, right? If you think about how cities grow. Yes, you sometimes get you know, tower blocks that go up to increase density. But in general, they add new things on the outsides. You get new suburbs appearing. And in fact, there's been a lot of research done into, into city health. And you can actually measure, if you measure the boundary line or how big a city is, you can calculate something called the fractal dimension of, a, of, of the city. And the higher the fractal dimension, if you like, the, the more crinkly the outsides are as you're adding new things, the healthier the city is, as measured by all these other things. We add stuff on the outside. And this is kind of, in some ways, what we're sort of trying to do, what we were trying to describe with microservices, think about things like the business capabilities. We're trying to create these discrete things that we can add things onto without necessarily changing the things in the, in the middle. Trying to create um, high fractal dimension software systems, if you like. Yeah, okay, maybe that's a bit much. <laughs> uh, but interestingly, there is, I think, a research, uh, sort of an open research question as to whether enterprise service buses would decrease your enterprise fractal, uh, enterprise architecture fractal dimension, and which would demonstrate poor architectural health. I don't know if that's, is there any academics in the room? They're not admitting it? Right, fair enough, I'll do it. So it's interesting, as cities grow, you get these different, different um, effects happening. Infrastructure, economies of scale, socioeconomic effects, returns to scale, and in general, cities don't die either. It's very hard to kill off a city, even Detroit. You know, that's still going and getting healthier. You know, even though, you know, people, well, yes, moving on. So, and then again, this is key, you get 115% more cool stuff and slightly bad stuff for only 85% of the cost. And to contrast that with most organizations, you get 85% more stuff for 85% of the cost. Right, you don't get the 115, you get 85. So, are there organizations out there that are sort of taken advantage of this? Because this seems like something quite profound that's going on here. Can we build our, our software development organizations, other organizations, whatever, um, in such a way that we can take advantage of these two factors? Like, you get the economies of scale, so we don't have to spend so much to get bigger, and then get returns to scale. We'll get more as we get bigger. And I think there are. I mean, anyone who's ever looked at the Spotify model, or actually most of the stuff underlying microservices, that's exactly what we're trying to describe trying to describe small world networks, right? Actually, if you look at ThoughtWorks, we kind of did this. Um, I hope Dave is going to agree with me at this point. I don't know if there are any other thought workers in the room. But we grew by Dunbar's number. We didn't grow by expanding our offices till they get really big. We grew by adding more offices in a country. So we have two offices in the UK. We don't have one in London. We have one in London, one in Manchester, around about the 200, just over Mark. In India, we've got however many seven now, I think. China, it's similar numbers. They're slightly bigger, but still we're growing in that kind of fractal way, deliberately doing that. And if you ever came across Valve's employee handbook, when that was leaked a while ago, anyone, anyone, Bueller? Yeah, a few people. Anyone work for Valve? Sorry? Valve Right. <laughs> um, well, actually, Valve's employee handbook had a small world network in it. <laughs> they said deliberately, this is what we're trying to do. 
We're trying to build an organization based on these personal relationships, based on when we, we get to, you, know, you get to choose who you associate with, banking on the fact that those returns to scale would come from that. And of course, as I mentioned at the start, Amazon. I mean, for all their faults, we're not gonna get into that. Amazon deliberately went out to organize themselves in this way. So if you think about the constraints that Jeff Bezos sort of, um, enumerated in the original memo he wrote, when, when was it, like 2002, something like that, four? Some of those constraints, teams must communicate via interfaces. All interfaces must be externalizable, must be able to sell them essentially to other teams or whatever. And two pizza stroke Dunbar's number teams. Jeff Bezos added constraints that meant that Amazon grew as a social network or a small world network organized company. Now, would it be a surprise if I told you that Jeff Bezos is a patron of the Santa Fe Institute? Ooh, it's not paranoia if they are out to get you, right? This is the case, right? That's true. Jeff Bezos is a patron of the Santa Fe Institute. Um, I, I couldn't work out when he started, be, be, when he became a patron, that's not publicly available, but he is a patron. And these, these constraints through which Amazon is growing to the size it is, uh, are deliberately there, if you like, to help create this small world networked company. And as I said at the start, you've got this 1.15, yeah, we will need to see what happens in the future, but it appears that as they get bigger, it's easier for them to get bigger. Whereas for most organizations, as you get bigger, it's harder. Amazon are getting the returns to scale and the economies of scale in the same way that cities are, or so it appears. So I mentioned, you know, DevOps flow and scale, that was the title. But I mentioned that, you know, at the start, or towards the start, this Jeffrey West quote, quantities that do not change, they've got this special kind of role in science, because they point the way to some kind of underlying truth about what's going on. I think my description for this talk with the abstract was talking about um, you know, have we discovered how to, how to make, you know, how, what good organizational design finally looks like? And I think we have. I think we have. And I think there are organizations out there that are already taking advantage of it. And again, you know, back to the start, Martin and me, when we put these together, you know, we didn't have this in mind. We were basing this on it was empiricism. Essentially, we were looking around at the things that we were seeing that organizations were doing that was making them successful and we came up with this list. But I think you can kind of see, well, I've sort of seen over time that there are these underlying things that you can sort of find behind this. The ideas of modularity, but the ideas of you know, these sort of um, invariant terminating units. What is that for a microservice? I've long, long said that essentially microservices are turtles all the way down, you know? Because um, people say, what's the right size? I say, it's the size of my head, ha ha. Um, but I sort of say, you know, if you, if you think about starting with like a method call, a line of code, then a method call, and then you chunk up to, say, a class, if you're an OO, and you chunk up to, um, say, a namespace, and you chunk up to uh, an application or a library, and you chunk up a little module, and you chunk up again uh, to a service, and you chunk up again to a group of services interacting uh, to form a, uh, a business capability. Each of those things should do one thing and do it well, should have a single responsibility, should have separation of concerns, should be modular. And this is essentially what complex adaptive systems are all about, building complexity from simple, small, simple things on, underneath. Um, so I suspect we've actually sort of come up with, or rather, I didn't, a bunch of smart people at Los Alamos and then Santa Fe have cracked this, like, what is it about complex adaptive systems? How can we use them um, to build better software, better organizations, and so on? Um, and, you know, just to go on to, you have to have some tips. So here's some tips. <laughs> do stuff. Basically, read Accelerate, do everything it says <laughs> after you've read Dave's book. But these are all the things from Accelerate. So to sum up, performance can be predicted by the rate at which information and work flows. Um, the advice, I guess, is if you're going to change, start where you are, get the basics under control, maybe get some you know, measurements in around these four key metrics to track organizational health. Um, and don't skimp on innovation. I skipped over that, but that is really interesting that um, a decrease in R&D spend is correlated with corporate mortality. It's literally the lifeblood of your organization. And then the next thing, I guess, finally, is this idea around super exponential growth. How do you organize for super exponential growth? 
because sub sublinear growth and mortality are fundamental characteristics of corporate hierarchies. This is like a thing, <laughs> like a real thing. So can you experiment? What would it look like in your company to start experimenting with small world, small world networks instead? And also, and I think this is something that, again, is quite fascinating, this idea of externalities. Like the time is, I think we've moved on now from the idea of organizations owning and like being really protective of, of their IP. And I think Amazon showed the way with their constraints and said, we're going to make our, yeah, anything that we think is our IP, we're going to monetize, we're going to externalize, we're going to sell it. And sometime they'll turn on their supply chain and every other <laughs> supply chain company in the, in the world will go out of business. But can you externalize things? Or can you create a set of constraints rather that will lead to, uh, lead to the effects that you want? One brief thing, because I said you can make more money than God, but of course the implication behind all of this is that uh, with super, if we're all growing super exponentially, we're super exponentially con consuming resources. We're super exponentially, essentially, uh, progressing towards the end times. <laughs> um, the whole climate change, you know, climate rebellion, all that kind of situation. Well, this is literally going to make that worse, actually. Like super linear growth in cities is making this stuff worse. The more cities we have, the bigger they are, the worse this is going to get, if you like. And the same with companies, the more resources we consume. Um, I'm going to finish with this uh, slide. This is Factorio, if anyone of you played this game. Um, yeah, got some smiles, that's good. Um, this is, again, from, um, from Jeffrey West and Scale. Unbounded growth requires accelerating cycles of innovation to avoid collapse. Essentially, as our economy and as the companies we work for start achieving this superlinear growth, and as cities, we have more and more cities that are growing superlinearly, um, we approach something called a finite time singularity. That's what these lines are. That TC, in this case, the red line, hits that dotted line. The other red lines underneath them, as you can see, they represent points in time where innovations occurred. So things like uh, you know, the Industrial Revolution, the computer, the computer age these things, which essentially reset us as a race approaching this, this finite time singularity. And if we don't reset every now and again, if we don't out-innovate this super exponential growth curve, well, um, in physics terms, there's something called a discontinuity in the equations. Now, no one knows what that means for human race. We know what it means in sort of galactic terms, we get black holes from it, right? For the human race, we don't know what like a discontinuity in the growth equations mean, but it doesn't sound great. Um, so we've either got to out-innovate this, uh, or we've just got to, I guess, stop doing what we're doing. Um, so I thought I'd leave you with that really cheery note after telling you how to make more money than God. Yeah, thanks very much. <laughs>